So yes, they will go wrong. Um, it's hard on anyone, no matter how long you've been in this game, yeah. to read negative feedback. And it doesn't matter that it's only one of 50. Mm -hmm. e your brain is just going to go right to it. And what I think you need to realize, first of all, is did I take care of the most of the group? A and B, whoever brought you in, did you meet their objective? And then for the one person for whom it went wrong, we don't know if they just got diagnosed with cancer. We don't know if this is the anniversary of their parents' dad. I mean, you just don't know what might have happened with them. So even though it's hard to um, sort of let that go, you, it's, you won't stay in speaking very long if you are not able to. The other thing is remember about the style. So I had one that I remember even now. And she just, ba it was one of my trainings, and she says, you know, if you'd left out of the stories, we could have been here, been gone, you know, been done in half the time. Well, I happen to know that for most people, the stories are critical, because the stories are what lets their brain relax and be ready to take in more, and in my case, most often, they also illustrate some important point. I acknowledge that in the universe, there are some people for whom stories would waste their time. So, in some ways, she was just expressing her personal preference. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. But then I decide, overall, it was still a good idea. Now, sometimes someone will say something to me, and I'll say, you know, there's some validity in that. Before you get defensive, you need to stop and say, was I just too much into my stories that day? You know, did they go a little too long? So, it could be that this person is saying something that the others are just aren't willing to say. Yes, and you come to classes like yours. You join Toastmasters. I mean, there are definitely skills that absolutely can be learned. So you will accelerate that learning dramatically when you get help. People are not, there are very few people who are natural speakers. And those who are could be 10 times better if they got some of the ideas about how to structure and how to decide and and you know all the things that you would cover in your course and that they get in Toastmasters and if they're wanting to be paid to speak that they would get in the National Speakers Association. Uh, so I've been in this business for 35 years. I am still getting good ideas to get better. Nobody's done. If they're done, they're probably buried. There are some um, aspects of giving a speech that I think can really get in somebody's way and can really reduce the impact of the speech. So we start with the idea again that the first step in assessing your speech is what impact do we need? What result do we need for the audience? And that's step one. If you don't have that in mind, you shouldn't be planning your speech yet. So you really have to get that in order. The things that I think will really get in, uh, in the way of a good speech, one of them is apologizing for anything if the audience doesn't already know there's a problem. So um, if you've spilled something down your shirt and it's red and your shirt is white, you're probably going to have to say something about it. If your shirt is red and they can't tell, let it go. Um, I remember I was in a car accident um, on the way to a speech. And I actually, high speed collision, broke my nose, had to not do that speech. But the very next one was, I don't know, three weeks later. And I'd recovered enough that nobody could tell, right? But it was the first speech after a pretty scary accident. So I was not on my game. And I knew it, but I knew I could do a good job, right? So I could have had the introduction be something like, you know, first speech back after her accident. We're so glad she was able to come because we really weren't sure she could. So, you know, really give her a round of applause that she'd even show up. Everybody would be worried now about the accident. It would take us completely off our game. Well, it happened, the speech was to the National Speakers Association about roadblocks in speaking. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I did the introduction I would normally do. I actually got started on it. And then I went off to the side of the stage, did a little time out. I said, let me tell you what actually happened. And then I told them about the accident, uh -huh. right? Because if they had known and didn't need to know, mm -hmm. then it would be in the way. Now, this particular group, because of the topic, it turned out it was good for them to know. Mm -hmm. Because we were able to talk about how do you work around some of those things. Mm -hmm but I still didn't open with it. I didn't want them to be concerned or worried. Now, if you show up and you're in crutches, you have to deal with it right away. Mm. So at one point I had um, blown out my back. I actually initially couldn't walk. Yeah. And then for the first 
oh, probably five or six presentations, I either was on crutches or I had a crutch with me. Um, well, you can't walk in on crutches and not say something. Um, or you can't have a crutch ready just in case, you know. <laughs> so for those groups, I would you know, s say, hey, by the way, I got a crutch because I blew out my back, but I'm doing really well. And I promise to tell you if I take pain meds because the program gets a little different when I take drugs. And they all laugh, and it is funny, but now this is taken care of. They don't have to worry about the crutch, and they don't wor have to worry about me. So um, I don't um, apologize. If I am behind on time, I don't even tell them. They don't know. The audience will never know there's a problem if I can keep it from them. They just won't because that gets in the way. That means I have to manage my emotions around that problem in any way, and the focus is always audience-centered at that point. So you really, once you are in the room or anywhere in the environment, you're, you leave your ego at the door, you leave your personal problems at the door, unless it's a crutch, and then you got to tell them, right? Um, you get very audience focused, and what happens then is that when things go wrong, if you already have decided to be and are really in that audience focused space, then when things go wrong, the first thing you think of is how does this affect the audience and do I need to do anything about it? If it's a fire alarm going off, obviously you do. Um, if it is somebody in the next room that's dropping something, if it's once, you don't. If it keeps happening, you make a joke out of it, and then you say, let's take a quick break, and you go ask the people in the other room to keep it down. I went to training for bankers in the evening next door to a Toastmasters. Now, the Toastmasters, every, what is it, four minutes or eight minutes, they're all applauding and so forth. And so I, after the third one, you know, it was clear it was going to be a little disruptive. So I said, you know what, I think that they should know that we're having fun too. So every time they applaud, we're going to stop and applaud too. So we started hooting and hollering. They had a blast. It was funny. And it just basically turned something that would have been bothering everybody into, you know, something that was manageable. So, but if you're audience focused, you can see. You can see people in the back that they can't hear or they can't see or there's something going on or they're getting too hot. Another interesting thing about public speaking, I think, at least the way that I do it in longer time frames, is that your brain is like it's bifurcated. I guess that would only be two spaces. There's, there's like 10 things going on. Because A, you're having to focus on the content and the way you deliver it, key. B, you're monitoring the audience the whole time. C, you're paying attention to the time. D, you're thinking, is the warm room too warm? You know, E, you're going, did they say they were gonna bring lunch in at noon or am I supposed to, you know, I mean, your, your brain is just, it's just segmented. And you're having to follow all of that while the audience thinks you're only paying attention to them. Yeah. They will never know all the variables, and they don't need to know. They absolutely don't need to know. All they need to do is get what they need. And all you need to do, really, is give them what they need. Okay, so I'll give you, uh, excuse me, <laughs> sometimes it is that severe. Um, especially if you have, uh, you're dealing with an illness yourself. Especially if it's one that just came on. Right? Yeah. So you started the day and you were fine, and you start to realize, okay, food poisoning, and you know, what is this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I actually have had a couple of times where, and in 35 years, so you know, I've got a lot of years to do this in, but probably two or three times where I literally became ill, and I'm trying to figure out, do I tell them? Mm -hmm. Certainly, I don't want to get them ill, so if I don't know, is it food poisoning or what, you know, I start modifying how close I am to them because I do tax return training. I come around while people are working on case studies and help them. Um, so back to the do they need to know thing. If I don't feel well but it's not contagious um, and they don't know, they will never know. I will not tell them. If it potentially could be contagious, like it, and it just came down that morning and I'm, you know, um, I'll, I'll do, you know, the old, hi, not shaking hands today, might have a cold, right? Uh, there was one time when I became ill. I, I, I think it was food poisoning. I got like deathly ill. And at lunch, when they were gone to lunch, I actually laid down underneath the table to figure out, okay, can I get better enough? What is it? How bad is it? Because this is a two-day training, right? And um, got one of the banquet staff brought me some seven up, you know, and I'm just trying to troubleshoot. Am I even able to overcome this? Um, and in that case, I'm pretty sure I wasn't. So when they came back from lunch, I just had to say, you know, guys, I don't know what's going on. 
but I've become extremely ill and I'm not able to continue with you today. And in this case, it was my own training as opposed to brought in by somebody else. So I could just say, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to leave for the day. I'm going to get back out to you on what dates would be work for you. I had to pay for the hotel. There was a lot of cost involved. Um, but I didn't tell them I was, you know, something was wrong until I had figured out that I could not fix it. Um, so it can happen. It helps to know ahead of time what your plans. You go back to planning, right? Things go wrong. I carry with me, gosh, I've got Imodium AD, I've got Tylenol, I've got ibuprofen. I actually have narcotics now because if my back does go, it's, it's extreme pain. My doctor wants me to travel with, you know, the Vicodin. I don't use it, but boy, I have it because if I'm traveling and I'm in Tampa and, and I herniate a disc, I will need some Vicodin, you know, to get back. Um, I have uh, I have other um, drugs. I have all kinds of things that if something went wrong that could short-term be fixed with something, I've got the short, oh, I've got throat coat tea with me, mm. you know, in case my throat is sore. Mm. Um, so I plan for things to go wrong. I, I plan to capsize is my sea kayaking phrase for that. I absolutely plan for things to go wrong. And if you're a sea kayaker you are, and you've gotten trained, you can self-rescue, you can rescue others, you can participate in your own rescue, you can assess that the wind has come up and what's that going to do and should I change course. Mm. Truly, you do all those things as a speaker. You've got all your tools, all your tricks, all the things that you've learned so that you can stay focused on the audience and they won't even know something's going wrong. And then when it really goes wrong enough, then you decide how do I tell them, what do I tell them, and can I still get them what they need given the circumstances we have now? If some of your students are in fact thinking about professional speaking, there's a couple avenues towards that. Often professional speakers actually have a like a first career or maybe a big experience. They climb Mount Everest on, you know, one leg or some you know, something unusual has happened to them. Um, some go right into public speaking, but often it's gonna be that you know, after some other experience. What I'd encourage people considering doing that to do is to recognize that that's a business. And just as if you were going to have a CPA firm, you probably belong to the Washington Society of CPAs and the American Institute of CPAs. Everything about public speaking and everything about running a business of public speaking can, in fact, be learned. It can be enhanced by seeking that out. So for public speaking, classes like yours, Toastmasters and so forth, are absolutely critical and will improve dramatically, dramatically their ability to have an impact on an audience. If it's about business, then the National Speakers Association and probably the professional association of whatever profession they're in as well um, can absolutely enhance their ability to be successful in the business of speaking and getting paid for it. So I would encourage people to continue to seek out the resources that will improve this skill because this skill, it cuts across every different job, every profession. It will enhance your ability to be an effective volunteer, an effective parent. There is no place that the skills you learn <coughs> for crafting an effective message and delivering it won't help you even if you don't decide to become a paid professional speaker.